much. And now what we're about to do is enter into our song service as the third segment of our camp meeting. So could we all stand and we're going to sing one of the theme songs of this camp meeting. And it's on page 375. Page 375. Work for the night is coming. Work for the night is coming. God we serve. And my friends, we are blessed to have among us Pastor Jerry O'Donnell, a powerful preacher. I've heard him speak on the conference line. And so I uh, just want to give this little tidbit. Uh, Pastor O'Donnell, evangelist, founder of Four Angels Message Ministry, a monthly printed publication in Bo Boiling Springs, Pennsylvania. He is a full-time husband, full-time dad, full-time servant of the Lord. Amen. 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 And he works a full-time job to support his family and ministry. He lives in the country on three acres of land, three and a half acres of land. Uh, he is happy to be out of the cities as we have been uh, counseled to do. He loves the present truth. That's powerful right there. He teaches and preaches messages from God to bring souls and his word together. Amen, my friend? Amen. So right now, why don't we give a hearty amen as Pastor Jerry O'Donnell comes to the podium. sufficient food to keep them alert, but not too sufficient to put you to sleep. Now, I would like to let you know a little secret, and that is uh, somehow I was uh, left out of the original distribution list as far as the schedule is concerned, so it was more of the last moment that I was told how many times I would speak, how many messages to prepare for, and basically two weeks before arriving. I spent an entire week praying to God to say, I need a message. I want to know what to preach versus 
I know what I want to preach, but I want him to tell me what I should preach. And so that whole week, I'm getting no answer. So it was this past, uh, yeah, it would have been Sunday. Sunday, I then get this impression. I'm there cutting, as far as that three and a half acres, a good portion of it is grass covered, and it takes me about five hours to cut the grass by push mower. By choice, I do not get a riding lawnmower that it eliminates the um, exercise. I want the exercise, so five hours. I had five hours of nothing but the lawnmower noise, me and God, and he impressed upon me. He said, there's this advertisement flyer has uh, exactly what you need to preach right there, the original one, and I'm looking it over, looking it over, and I'm thinking, what great prophecy could I actually dig out of the scriptures and present it to the people, and nothing's coming to mind, and then I reread that. It says, come to this seminar, and we will teach you many things, including how to study the Bible. Now, wait a second. Most of us have been studying the Bible for years. What type of message would this be other than to put somebody to sleep, especially after lunch? Now, as I'm putting this together, thinking that same thought, like, I'm not going to hold their interest. They probably know how to study the Bible. I'm being flooded with other information that becomes a part two to this. And that's entitled for tomorrow morning. You don't want to miss this. You think the NIV is just against the King James as far as, oh, they leave out some verses, they cut Jesus out of the scriptures and things like that. It goes far deeper. It's anti-Seventh-day Adventist. And I am going to show you 26 specific changes that actually interrupts us presenting the message with that Bible. We cannot use that. And yet that is one of the most popular versions of the Bible among Seventh-day Adventists. But this is part one. Part one is how to study the Bible. You probably know the answer. You're probably thinking right now in your mind, I know the scripture that tells us exactly how to do that. What book would we be going for that answer? Isaiah. Now, what about the chapter number? 28. Anybody want to fathom the uh, verse number? That's right. I'm going to actually back up to verse 9. Back up to verse 9. And I'm going to basically answer that question. How do you study the Bible? It says, whom shall he teach knowledge? That's what we want to know. And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Okay. Okay. Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast, for precept must be upon precept. We probably have this memorized. Precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little. And then it kind of repeats. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people to whom he said, this is the rest um, wherewith he caused the weary to, to rest. This is a refreshing, yet they would not hear. But the word of the Lord was unto them, Precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared be taken. There you go. That's the end of the sermon. You got your answer. You know, everybody was concerned about how long the sermon would be last night, and they would announce it uh, ahead of time, and I just did it in a couple minutes here. But let me just expand a little bit. You might not have picked it all up. It says, for precept upon precept. Do you know how many people will ask me what that is? You see, in the Bible, there are principles. And those principles, God uses our knowledge and understanding and reasoning that he gave to us 
to be able to figure out that, oh, thou shalt not murder also means not to hurt someone as well. That's a precept. It doesn't say that in the Bible specifically that I'm not allowed to hurt someone, but it does say about not to kill. Line upon line, we should have no problem with. That's verse, take a verse on to another verse. But this here little and there little, I don't understand that. Well, how many times do you find multiple topics in one verse? Don't get distracted with all the other content of it. Pick out that section that you need. For instance, you want to do a simple study on, I want joy in my life. Well, isn't the fruits of the Spirit one of them, joy? But there's like six other fruits there too, or f- pieces of fruit. Don't get distracted with those other pieces. Focus on the word joy, recognizing that it's the fruit of the Spirit. So there you go. That's what precept is, a principle. A line is a verse. Here a little, you may have to take a smaller section of the verse. And again, I have now presented you the answer to the question of how do you study the Bible. Sermon over. All right. That was a logical answer. I have made two mistakes if that's how I study the Bible. Number one, there's probably somebody here screaming, when are you going to open up with prayer? Oh, we're to invite God when we open up the scriptures? Yes. So that's mistake number one, that basically the vast majority of the world makes a mistake. I just demonstrated to you the wrong thing. You don't just go open the Bible, find an answer, and say, there, I got my answer. You're no different than an atheist who looks for that verse to clobber Christians over and says, see, there's a contradiction here. They did not invite God to help them see the contents of his word. The second thing is you never go and open the scriptures just looking for the answer that agrees with you so that you can now present it to other people. You have the wrong attitude. Those are two mistakes that basically many, many, many people, especially even of Christian faith, make every single day. That they open the Bible, that is. If they open the Bible every day. So with that, let us get God's answer to that question now. How do we study his word? And we begin with prayer. Our Father, it may sound like a simple question. How do we study the Bible? Even on simple thought processes, we are never, ever to open the scriptures without the invitation here to have you help us by thy spirit to see thy word clearly and allow thy word to have the effect upon us that it should have not to give away other parts of this real sermon that's coming up. But nonetheless, it is very important that we invite you now into our hearts and minds. Please guide us and direct us as we are to be guided by truth, or into truth, that is, convicted of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Lead us now, I pray in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. All right. I have to admit, this is going to be a little challenging. I'm used to having uh, both hands uh, to maneuver things, but we'll get along. First sub-question to how do you study the Bible? Why? What does God's word actually do for you? It's not to just fill your mind with logical answers. Turn with me to John chapter 17. John chapter 17 And we're going to look at verse 17. John 17, 17. And yes, I've been asked by more than one person, do you have PowerPoint slides? And the answer is no. I want you to read the the words right before your eyes. We're going to use good old-fashioned, move the Bible around, turning pages. So with that in mind, John 17, 17 says... 
sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. What you see here is that the power of the word of God is to make us a holy people. It is to sanctify us. That is the primary reason why you are opening up the scriptures, to be led by him, as I said, by thy, his Holy Spirit. We are to be convicted of sin. And that just is not made aware of sin. But we are to then stop sinning. Of his righteous ways, and it's not just to know them what they are, but that we would actually obey them. And then be made a people that is ready to be judged, for the judgment is before us. Again, the work of the Holy Spirit, convict us of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment, guiding us into truth. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And let's look here in verse 18. 2 Corinthians 3.18, the Bible says, But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. In other words, it's the same principle that was referred to by other speakers by beholding through the word of God. That's how we behold Christ. We become Christ-like. Again, this is reaffirming what does the scriptures, studying the scriptures, actually do for us. Not only sanctify us, but to form the character of Christ. Turn with me while we're at it, because something else comes to mind that is abused. What do you think is abused? I guess that's a rhetorical question. Believe it or not, church is abused. What? How do you abuse church? Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4 now. And here, we're going to start reading in verse 11. Ephesians 4, verse 11. The Bible says, And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors, and teachers. The end of that verse really implies we got some church leadership going on here. Yes, there are some other uh, people involved, such as an evangelist, doesn't necessarily always hang out in one particular church. They travel. So pastors and teachers definitely make up the local church. What are they for? They are, verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. You go to church to be made perfect. You do not go to church to socialize. You do not go to church by pulling people off the street called friendship evangelism, drag them to church. They're all nervous, have no idea what to expect, and now they're sitting in the pew. Now the pastor is looking out and sees all these new faces, strangers. And what does the pastor do? He turns his sermon into friendship, friendly advice, so not to offend our visitors so that they come back again. Because if they get the straight truth, they'll be running for the doors. And that's an abuse of church. The pastor is not to water down the message. The people coming through the doors are to realize what sin is. They are to hear the word of God, not watered down. And so we should not be turning our churches into an environment in which allows us to uh, use it basically as an evangelistic series. Church is not an evangelism environment. It's after evangelism that you have won them off the street. Now they come continuously to church to get cleaned up because I know when I came out of the baptistry I was not endowed with everything that is right and wrong in my life and from that moment forward was work walking perfectly I needed more information as we all do 
In fact, you could probably quote it. Sanctification is not for a moment, but the work of a lifetime. Every time we come to church, we should be grow growing by the grace of God. That is what the word of God is supposed to do. Again, it sanctifies. It's to uh, develop perfection in us by hearing the word of God by the preacher of the time, the teacher of the, of the moment, making us a holy people. Now, how much of the word of God is efficient for this? Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, and we already have a brother that knows the answer. That is correct. 2 Timothy, however, as I always love to do, is even though we have the right answer, I like seeing it in black and white. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17 says, all, that's the word that I heard from a brother just a moment ago, and he's right, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. See? That's what the purpose of the Word of God is. What's the result? That the man of God may be perfect. Ooh, there's a dirty word among many conference churches. Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Everything about us should be transformed to develop and to exercise good works. Now, I bring this out, and you're probably saying, yeah, we're Seventh-day Adventists. We believe in all the scripture. Then you tell me why some pastor, I believe it's in Seattle, is saying that there are six verses in the Bible that are called clobber texts, and we should get rid of those. And the congregation goes and says, amen. No amen. Personally, that particular conference church should actually be disbanded. If that's their attitude that they want to cut up the scriptures, they're not Seventh-day Adventists. The pastor should be fired, and yet Ted Wilson does nothing. But, and I'm not a defender, by all means, you take Doug Batchelor, who says that he's against women's ordination, and he plans for a meeting in Florida, this is some years ago, just a few, and he's banned all of a sudden at the last moment, he has to redirect his message to another state instead. I think he went to Michigan instead of Florida. That's because the former Pennsylvania president, now president of the Florida conference, is what put the stop there. I could have said that that was gonna happen, because I know, dropping a name, Mike Colley, Wolves in sheep's clothing. But that's a separate subject. What do we do, though, about the conflicts in the Bible? First question I have is, what conflicts? However, let's see what the scriptures have to say. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Let's go there. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And let's take a look here in verse 33. 1 Corinthians 14, 33, the Bible says, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all churches of the saints. In other words, God doesn't send confusing messages. He does not tell one prophet, write this down, and then tells another prophet, write the opposite. The confusion comes into our understanding of those verses. That's where the confusion is. Now, let's get another scripture. I hope you didn't close your Bibles yet be, and, and get ready for another one because the one before it also helps. Verse 32 says, And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. So if we find something in the writings of Peter that seems to contradict Isaiah, Something may be wrong with Peter's writings. Not that we just choose which one we want. By the way, that's usually not the case. The case is our understanding of what Peter wrote, as opposed to there being confusion. 
There is no confusion in the scriptures, brothers and sisters. Anybody that claims that the word of God conflicts are liars. Why? 2 Peter chapter 1, speaking of Peter, 2 Peter, in 2 Peter chapter 1, let's look here at verses 20 and 21. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21 knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Can you uh, say amen to the fact that all the contents of the Bible are just mere writers? The real author is the Holy Spirit. So why would the Holy Spirit inspire... Years ago, one thing, and then years later, change his mind. He would not. So the author is actually the Holy Spirit inspiring these men to write. Now, I do have one conflict in my mind that I like to address because it actually, using the principle that we just learned, Matthew chapter 12, verse 31 it is said, and I've shared this with the church before, Matthew 12, 31, I've shared with the church before that there is a quote from Ellen White that says, the Holy Spirit is Jesus Christ. I admit, it is there. I've already addressed it. I'm not going to readdress it. But in preparing this message, I came across one of those interesting Bible verses which answers this whole nonsense that there is no Holy Spirit thing to uh, fabrication, that it cannot be, it cannot be Jesus Christ. In verse 31, it says, Wherefore I say unto you, Matthew 12, 31, All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. You may not have caught it, so let me continue reading. And whosoever speak a word against the Son of Man, who's that? Isn't that Jesus? It shall be forgiven him. Okay, so we could speak whatever we want against Jesus, and it's forgiven. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Wait a second. If the Holy Spirit is Jesus Christ, and I can say anything about Jesus Christ and yet be forgiven, but I can't do it to the Holy Spirit, we have a conflict here. The Holy Spirit cannot be Jesus Christ. Because if I speak against Jesus Christ, I'm speaking against the Holy Spirit, and that's not forgiven, but yet I am forgiven if uh, I speak uh, as far as with Jesus. Now, on the other side is, if I speak against the Holy Spirit, but yet I am forgiven because of the words of Jesus against Jesus is forgiven, then what do we do about the part that says the Holy Spirit? That part's not forgiven. You can't have it both ways. You're either held responsible for every word against both Jesus and the Holy Spirit, or you're just forgiven against Jesus and the Holy Spirit. In other words, this is a proof text that shows you that the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ are two separate beings. Now, yeah, amen to that, brother. Now, how is God's word understood? Let's go to Romans chapter 8, and this is why I said in my prayer that I kind of gave away part of the sermon. Romans chapter 8 and verse 6. So let's go there, Romans 8, verse 6. The Bible says, For to be carnally minded is death, but to, the, to be spiritually minded is life and peace. If you do not have the right mindset going into the Bible, you will not understand the Bible. No wonder a whole bunch of Christians says, even Seventh-day Adventists, I can't see that. I can't see that. You're right, brother and sister. That's because you're carnally minded. you got to become spiritually minded to understand God's word. Let's get another text. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 
verse 14. The Bible says, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 14, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Spiritually things are spiritually discerned. God's word is a spiritual matter. You need to have the Holy Spirit. In other words, you dare not open the scriptures without inviting the Holy Spirit to guide us in the study of the scriptures. And that's why I reconfirm that, yes, that needs to be done. Now, let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2 and find out how many different ways there are to understand the Bible. Because I will obviously get a lot of people that will say, well, that's your interpretation. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. At the very minimum, there are two ways to understand the Bible. Rightly, and you probably guessed it, wrongly. Unfortunately, wrongly it comes in many different flavors. So there could be thousands of ways to understand the scriptures, but they're not correct. There is a right way, and all other ways are wrong. That is what we're supposed to get from that verse. What caution is given? 2 Peter chapter 3. Peter gives us a caution when we study particularly somebody's writings. You might be already guessing whose writings that Peter had a problem with. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. So that was 2 Peter chapter 3, picking up in verse 15. An account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. As also in all epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they, are un they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. It's not just Paul's writing. It's the other writings. People will wrestle the scriptures to fit what they want because they are cardinally minded. So that is what we have going on here. There is a warning of studying the Bible, and that is we need to learn properly to study it, and we not, must not be wrestling with the Scriptures to our own understanding. That is why so many Christians say, oh, the Bible, I can't figure it out. It's so confusing. No, leave off everything you've been taught, now study the Bible, and you'll understand the Bible is very easy to understand. It's when you're trying to fit all kinds of things into all the theories that are out there that are in error, and the Bible's not supporting those, and no wonder you're having a hard time. So let us be careful that, uh, and realize there are some things that are hard to understand. I will admit that you will, and I do not, necessarily always have the answer. There are some scriptures that I did not get the answer until many years later. I do not distrust the word of God, and I do not say that it's confusion. I just set it aside, keeping in the back of my mind what it is until God clears it up. And you know how God usually clears it up? Continuous study. And you will find out that other verses in the Bible will unlock the mystery eventually right combination. So, what shall we do regarding the Old Testament? Let's go to Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15 is where we're headed next. Romans chapter 15 and particularly verse 4. Romans 15, 4. Okay. The Bible says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, 
uh, that we through patience and comfort of the scripture might have hope. They were written for us, brothers and sisters. Do not listen to the lie that the Old Testament is closed, is done away with, has been fulfilled by literal Israel, and now we live in the New Testament era. There are many prophecies, countless ones that refer to the second coming, that have yet to be fulfilled. Yet, they are labeled as those pertaining to Israel. You need to further understand the scriptures to, to realize that Israel is not a piece of land over in the Middle East. Israel, cutting to the chase, is the true Seventh-day Adventist, while everybody else is Babylon. And those prophecies are and will be fulfilled. Because everything has to be fulfilled, just as Jesus led his life, fulfilling the scripture all the way through. Could Jesus have taken some shortcuts? Yes. Did he? No. Neither will we. John chapter 5. So as it, Jesus even said, we must suffer it so, so that the scriptures may be fulfilled. So you think it's tough times right now with the inflation and stuff like that, we must suffer through those things to fulfill scripture. And so just when you thought that, oh, it's just a, a random act that's happening, no, you're fulfilling scripture. Both of us, meaning you and I. All right, John 5, 39 is where we're headed. John 5, 39, Jesus says, Search the scriptures. Which scriptures? Well, the New Testament wasn't written when Jesus said this, so that must be the Old Testament. For in them ye think ye have eternal life. What? You mean I can get eternal life from studying the Old Testament? Absolutely. And they are they which testify of me. So therefore, you can actually get a closer relationship with Jesus Christ without necessarily reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John only. You can get it from the Old Testament. So, what are the results uh, after a proper Bible study? Let's go to Luke chapter 11 now. Luke chapter 11. Let's go there. Luke chapter 11. And we are going to look here at verse 28. Luke 11 and verse 28. The Bible says, but he said, yea, rather blessed are they that hear the word of God. Brothers and sisters, are you hearing me? Do I hear an amen? amen. Thank you. That is, it's true. That amen wasn't for me. It was for God. You are hearing the word of God. There is no period there. It says, and Keep it. So when we study the word of God, the result should be that, oh, I didn't know that. I will now obey it. That is the result of studying the scriptures. When you study the scripture and you find something new, you don't say, I don't see anybody else following it. You have to make the conscious decision to follow it. I actually had one member of our home church uh, throw at me all kinds of examples where Martin Luther was a smoker, was an, basically an alcoholic, and he's going to be in heaven? He didn't know better. But you do, sister. That was a sister that asked me. That's the difference. Don't try and justify. So, what does the scripture do for us as far as keeping us from? Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and I'm not referring to, oh, I can't do that, I can't do that. No, I'm not referring to that. And by the way, for those that have that attitude that, oh, I don't want to study the scriptures because then I can't do certain things, just remember, no good thing does he withhold from us. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, let's look at the first five verses. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. But of the times, am I in the, yeah, but of the times 
and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. I'm not talking about that false thief in the night either. For when they shall say peace and safety, which they are striving so much for today. We're on the verge of them declaring it, brothers and sisters. There's a solution coming to inflation, to this whole, as was said in the morning session, pandemic. There's a solution to all of this that's happening. It's coming. And then they're going to declare, see, finally, everything is at peace and safety. Nothing's going to hurt you. Then sudden destruction come upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Verse 4 says, But ye brethren are not in darkness, which is the answer. What does studying the word of God do for us as far as keeping us from? Darkness. That that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. So that's what we should have in us is that we should become people of light. And then there's a purpose for that. What are we to do with that light? Go to Matthew chapter 5. You think, maybe not you specifically, but in general, people think that, oh, I, I study the Bible to get something out of it. And then once they get their answers, they're all done. No, brothers and sisters, the work has just begun. In fact, that's pretty much what the theme of this happens to be. We're hoping that this camp meeting is where you become transformed into better Christians, better Seventh-day Adventists, even sanctified, and then you're going to do something that is revealed in Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 to 16. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savor, where, I'm sorry, um, Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. So, picking up again in verse 13, ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden underfoot of men. Now, this, is the, this next verse is why I brought us here. Remember, you're the children of light. That's what we just read a moment ago. Now, ye are the light of the world. Yeah, we just heard that a moment ago. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Reading verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. We need to go forth from this camp meeting then once it's over and present the light to a dark and dying world. We have a responsibility. Do you know how often I get asked via letter, via email, saying, brother or sister, do you know other fellow Seventh-day Adventists that I could fellowship with on Sabbath? I feel like I'm all alone. Guess what? Welcome to, I hate to say it, to the club. We are all alone. But what does that mean? It means, as I am, the ministry is uh, from Boiling Springs, I do not know another Seventh-day Adventist in Boiling Springs. I am responsible for all of Boiling Springs. In fact, there's some other small towns around there. Mount Holly is a another name. That I don't know of a Seventh-day Adventist in Mount Holly. I am now responsible for Mount Holly, too. And I have found out, I hate to drop names, but the SDA Church of Carlisle, not so responsible. I may have to engulf a large city and be responsible for Carlisle as well. Brothers and sisters, we are all individually called to share our light, and we 
have teetering all around us souls every day that are dying without the light being shared. We have to have the burden of souls upon us going forth from here. And individually, instead of trying to run to our pastor, hey, pastor, I think I might have a Bible study for you. Or, uh, excuse me, why aren't you doing it? Oh, I don't know how to do that. I might make a mistake. Again, welcome to the club. You don't learn how to give Bible studies without making a few mistakes. I look back on a number of occasions where I said, oh, man, I should have given this answer. Oh, man, I should have gave that answer. And God's saying, don't keep kicking yourself. It's called a learning experience. I'll take care of those souls. I'll send somebody else to cross their paths, some literature. And if their souls are open to, to reading it, they'll be in the kingdom. If not, they weren't going to be no matter what answer you gave. So we need to take it from that position that we are responsible and we might find another Seventh-day Adventist nearby, then the two of you are responsible for all that whole town. Now, with all that given, that may not be all-inclusive of how to study the Bible, but I would like to jump into a couple examples of where mistakes are made. A total of three, actually. So it's more than a couple. It's three. The first one addresses something that even Seventh-day Adventists can fall into. You know what the verse means. Uh huh. You, you have a built-in dictionary in your mind. You know what all these words mean. I mean, come on, there's, there's a, a verse here, it's only three letters long. What do you mean I, don't, I may not know that word? What are you talking about? Go to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, in which, especially every non-Seventh-day Adventist, do not know this three-letter word. Romans chapter 10. And you know what is also unfortunate? It's creeping into the Seventh-day Adventist church. Romans chapter 10. I know you're anxious here, but my fingers aren't cooperating at this very second. Romans chapter 10. Let's look here at verse 4. For Christ. I heard a page turn, so I want to make sure you're there. Following along here. In Romans chapter 10, verse 4, for Christ is the what? End of the law. Let me just, yeah, verse 4, okay. Uh, for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Do you know what the word end really means? Well, yeah, I mean, if you start something, you end something, it's over. But in this context, it's not, it's over. And that's what so many non-Seventh-day Adventists take this as. They think the law, the Ten Commandments, is done because Jesus Christ is here. If that's true, I have another verse for them. Go to James chapter 5, and I'll come back and explain that one to you. But go to James chapter 5. James chapter 5, and I want to show you something very interesting. If the word end means it's over, we might as well stop this camp meeting right now, go home, and pity ourselves because there's no future. Why would I say that? Romans chapter 5, verse 11. I held the verse off to the very end. Verse 11 says, Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and tender mercy. The Lord doesn't exist anymore. It's, it, the Lord is over. It's ended. He's ended. That is not what that means. The word end, as one brother said, means purpose. I also have another term. It's called result. 
I have seen the result of the Lord. So therefore, back in Romans, I have, uh, um, Christ is the result of the law. Does that really fit? Yes, it does. Why? What's the result of the law? Well, when I look at it, I broke it. What does that mean? I need a Savior. What does that mean? I need Christ. Because I have broken the law, Jesus has come to save me. Jesus is the result of me breaking the law. Because he would have come if I were the only soul to be saved. That is the meaning of the word end. Next example. John 3.16. Oh, we know this by heart. But this, my brothers and sisters, is to address another type of situation that people uh, mess up with Bible study. John 3.16, it's called tense. No, I'm not talking about getting tense in studying the Bible, but reading the proper tense. Now, I want you to follow along as I read what people think is there, as opposed to what is there. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not enter perishing, but have eternal or uh, everlasting life. Is that what that says? No. Whosoever believeth him should not perish. What is perish? It means it's been completely done. It, it, it gets consumed. You know, it goes along with the other Bible verses that they're going to be consumed away, the wicked that is. They take the word perish as meaning that if you don't make it to heaven, you go to hell and you sit there, roast and toast, perishing day after day after day after day, hour after hour after hour. It's not perishing. You perish. If something happens to be of the state of perish, it's done. It's been consumed. It's all gone. Yet it is the most quoted verse of all non-Seventh-day Adventists. I don't watch sports, but when I used to, John 3.16 is the banner. That's how popular it is. Yet, they don't read their own words. It says perish. Besides that, the verse itself also explains something else to you. If they go to hell and day after day for eternity are actually going through the state of perishing, would they also have everlasting life? Well, yeah. Yeah. I don't like it, but I would have everlasting life if I was burning in hell forever. But that's not what the verse said. You either have everlasting life or you perish. You don't. So we have to be careful with the tense of the words. Don't assume what you think is there. Now, our last example, and we'll wrap it up then is Revelation 16, 16. If you were into the movies, hint, hint, if you were into watching movies, if you heard the word Armageddon, what do you immediately have come to mind? Isn't it World War III? The whole world burning? Nuclear weapons firing off? Armageddon is equated with the next world war. You even see it in the headline news that we are on the verge of Armageddon. World War III is the substitute title. In reading Revelation 16, 16, the Bible says, and he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. Now, I have a few questions here. First off, it is not an event does it not say in that verse that it is a place? Secondly, who does the gathering? You see that word he? It is, it's attributed to Antichrist. 
Antichrist, according to evangelicals, will gather the people into this little valley called Megiddo and fight it out. When Ribera created this false theology, it sounded pretty good because there were not 8 billion people on the planet, yet the whole world is gathered there. That's problem number one. Problem number two, Ribera did not see that we could sit in the Oval Office, push a red button, and have World War III without gathering in a little valley. So the whole world is not going to gather in a little valley. But the question is, is who is he? Well, then, logically, you would back up in the verses to find out who he is. Let's just read, for instance, the one verse in front of it. Behold, I come as a thief. Who's coming as a thief? Jesus. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they seeth his shame. It's Jesus that does the gathering, not Antichrist. So the verse attributed to Christ is actually being attributed to Antichrist. It's an event as well as a location on earth. But the key to understanding what Armageddon really means is right there in the verse. It says in the Hebrew tongue, which means don't understand it in the Greek. What does the Greek say? Megiddo. That's not Hebrew. I'm not a big fan of Greek and Hebrew. I don't like getting into those arguments. So what I rather do is search through the scriptures trying to find out where in the scriptures there are similar words or phrases and it will give me the definition. Now I'm going to give you the definition and then I'm going to give you six verses to wrap it up. And that is, Armageddon is none other than the holy mountain of God in which all the people gather together that are going to be saved. How do I know that? Isaiah 56. Let's go there. Isaiah 56, verse 7. Isaiah 56, this is letting the Bible interpret itself. You know what, brothers and sisters, I just want to let you know, you have left the milk of the word. You are now into the meat of the word, just like Isaiah tells us to. That's another problem that a lot of Christians have in studying the Bible. They stay on the milk. What's that? I know the story of Jonah. I know the story of David and Goliath. That's what they know. The meat is to search out the scriptures, letting the Bible be its own interpreter. Did you know the King James Version of the Bible is its own dictionary? And the NIV ruins it. But then I'm getting ahead of tomorrow morning's message at 9 o'clock. Isaiah 56, verse 7. Watch the words. This is God speaking. Even them will I bring to my, what? Holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted up upon mine altar, for mine house shall be called the house of prayer for all people. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 14 now. In fact, most of these verses are in Isaiah, so we should hit them very quickly here. Isaiah 14. In Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12 through 14. It says here, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which dis weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also on the mount, mountain, Armageddon, of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. What does Satan want? He wants the congregation of God's people. These are the saved ones. These are the righteous ones. He wants to rule the universe. Let's get another one. Isaiah 51. Isaiah 51. 
And I believe it's verse 16. And I have put my words in thy mouth, and I have covered thee in the shadow of mine hand, that I may plant the heavens and lay the foundations of the earth and say unto Zion, by the way, which is a mount, thou art my people. A couple more verses. Let's go to Isaiah 66. Uh, that, uh, that was Isaiah 51, 16. 51, 5, 1. Now let's go to Isaiah 66. And let's look here at verse 20. Isaiah 66, 20, the Bible says, And they shall bring all your brethren for an offering unto the Lord out of all the nations upon horses and in chariots and litters and upon mules and upon swift beasts to my holy mountain. What? What's next? Jerusalem, saith the Lord, as the children of Israel bring an offering in a clean vessel into the house of the Lord. That was Isaiah 66, 20. The holy mountain is also known as Jerusalem. I have another word for it. It's called the New Jerusalem. Armageddon and New Jerusalem are one and the same. Now, I'm not going to read these next few verses, but they say the exact same thing out of Isaiah 66, 20, in that they equate holy mountain and Jerusalem. They are Daniel 9, 16, Joel, J-O-E-L, 3, 17, Zechariah 8, 3. All of those verses, all four of those verses say holy mountain equals Jerusalem. That's where God's going to gather us. Jesus is coming as a thief to gather us into the new Jerusalem, into Armageddon, into Zion. Now, Ezekiel, two more verses and then I'm done. Ezekiel, chapter 28, and let's look here at verses 13 and 14, referring to Satan. Ezekiel 28, 13 and 14, thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God, every press precious stone was thy covering, the sardis, the topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle and gold. The workmanship of the tabrets and of the pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. No wonder music is a problem in the last days. Verse 14, thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou has walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Satan was there. Satan was in Armageddon because it's a place, the new Jerusalem. Finally, let's go to Psalms 43. Let's hear the words of David. Psalm 43. Go to Psalm 43, and let's look here at verse 3. O send out thy light and thy truth. Let them lead me, let them bring me unto thy holy hill, mountain hill, and to thy tabernacles where God dwells. So Armageddon is not all this sci-fi, World War III, Antichrist. No, Jesus Christ wants to gather us. Verse 15 of Revelation 16, remember? He comes as a thief. It talks about the righteous. And then the very next verse, it says, He, Jesus, gathers them into a place called Armageddon. He's gathering his righteous people to Armageddon to the place of Armageddon, to Mount Zion, to the Holy Hill, the New Jerusalem. 
That was verse 3. So, my brothers and sisters, getting back to the basics, how do we study the Bible? Let the Bible be its own interpreter. Invite the Holy Spirit to start things off. Take it slowly. Forget what the world has taught you. Forget even what's going around in the Adventist faith. Confirm it through the Word of God. And I mean the false theories. That which is the pillars of our faith, never forget. Never forget. So when you hear the voice of, oh, the Holy Spirit is Jesus Christ, I think I just covered a, a very knockout verse there. It's impossible. So let us be careful with the Word of God and use it wisely. This is a mighty power. This is not a book. This is God's Word. And let's treat it that way. Our Father, thank you so very much that you have, over hundreds of years, put together by thy Holy Spirit your love story for us, love messages for us, that has power to transform lives. We see it every day. People who give this or that up, who want to be closer to thee, who want to make a commitment to follow thee all the way. May it have that transforming effect to make us, well, perfect. And may we continue to grow perfect each and every time we open up thy word. And may we not become as many other Seventh-day Adventists that hoard all this information and feel that it's good sermon content, great speakers, all to be used to become gluttons. May we share this light that we have because we have sympathy for the souls that are dying. And may that be a burden upon our hearts. May we do everything possible to reach them with this light and may we even go as far as spreading your messages like leaves of autumn. We ask these things in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.